Welcome to Equitex 2022 M&A Trends webinar. Thank you for joining us. I am Paul Dondos, Equitex Global Head of Market Intelligence and Biosite. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues who will introduce themselves to you in due course. Um, before we do that and uh, to allow people to join us now, um, one or two housekeeping points. First of all, you will have joined without your cameras and microphones on. Uh, this will remain the case throughout the webinar. Um, however, you may post comments and ask questions using the Q&A button uh, in the menu. And uh, we shall attempt to cover as many questions as we can during the session, others we can follow up on afterwards. Um, as a second point, if you do need to leave the webinar for some reason, don't worry. We can send you a copy of the webinar that's being recorded. Um, so, with that, um, let, me, let me ask us first of all why we're here. Um, Equitec helps owners and partners of firms in the knowledge economy to grow, acquire and realise equity value. For nearly 20 years, we've been publishing research on market trends, uh, M&A trends, valuation drivers, acquisition drivers, and we... Uh, intend through this session to discuss some of the major themes that we see uh, emerging through the coming 12 months and beyond, uh, with a view to providing actionable insights to uh, those of you with growth and or exit ambitions. So with no more ado, let's have some introductions from the panel. Um, we'll start with Sylvain. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Sylvain Mason. I'm a director at Equitech. I'm based in uh, Singapore and I'm uh, in charge of uh, deals across the Asia Pacific region and to some extent uh, India and Middle East. Afternoon, everybody, or morning for those um, connecting from the uh, US. I'm Jerome Glynn Smith, Managing Director for Equitech in Europe, um, supporting our teams and clients in uh, realizing liquidity events, um, raising funds, and making acquisitions in the uh, consulting and digital services spaces. Alex? Um, do you... Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Flos. I'm a director on the consulting and IT services M&A team here in the U.S. Uh, my focus is principally on helping sellers get ready to go to market and uh, through deal execution. Um, but with that, I'll hand it back to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, so before we dive into some of these uh, specific mega trends uh, that, we, that we are seeing uh, evolving through the year ahead, um, let me just make some comments on the general backdrop we're seeing uh, in the market. You'll all have seen the headlines. You're all aware of the heat that there is in M&A generally. I saw a note uh, to the effect that we were nearing five billion uh, in, in deal value across global M&A last year. Uh, the knowledge economy is a standout area of this um, that has seen factors of that we can broadly describe as supply and demand factors um, conspiring to, to drive uh, activity to uh, peak levels. Um, on the supply side, the quality uh, we could call it the supply has been steadily improving as businesses have uh, responded gro with growth and profitability increases um, to trends that have accelerated during uh, lockdowns and pandemic driven uh, events. So um, we found that there are more businesses that are available in market that are considering um, or at, are at a point where a transaction becomes the way to achieve uh, the next, next uh, step in their evolution. Uh, on the demand side, um, capital that capital is available through strategics and private equity um, for this area of the market uh, in an unprecedented way. Uh, strategics are seeing high uh, values through the public stock markets um, and uh, through their own coffers, and private equity is seeing unprecedented amounts of dry powder, as well as both uh, those uh, um, sources of capital having additional comfort from seeing more and more uh, stories and uh, playbooks of investments and acquisitions of these types uh, playing out positively. Um, so that is, is driving uh, an enormous amount of activity and something which, when we look at, uh, when we surveyed the market at the end of last year through our buyer's report, um, projections for how that could go on lay largely in the two to three year range. So whatever things we're seeing in corrections and, and um, counter forces, 
um, the, the, uh, the general assumption is that uh, those are temporary things in a strong ongoing story. But um, let's move into some of the specifics of that. And uh, I think we can start with Jerome on the adoption of digital. Is this something that's here to stay? Um, what are the main drivers behind it? Give us a top level view on this. Thanks, Paul. And I think it's a, it's a question we ask ourselves a lot, um, you know, when we've had such a good year in 2021 um, and a pandemic accelerating digital consumption um, and, and digital adoption, uh, one would think, you know, how, how long will this stay? Um, and I think the, the view is that um, the market will certainly get bigger in 2022. It's a growing market. Um, and thinking about the, the, the reasons for that, I think there are probably three um, general factors that, that drive that in 2022. Um, the, the, the first one, I think, would be that the, the digital workplace um, is here to stay. So the way employees engage with um, their employers, the way um, people engage with their clients is... Um, a, 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 a been completely transformed over the past couple of years and enabling that through digital tools for HR processes, for CRM processes, sales processes and delivery processes, project management processes has created a complex ecosystem um, which uh, has in turn led to companies owning complex technology stacks that will lead to integration work, that will lead to training work for, the, for this digital transformation investments to be um, ROI enhancing. Um, so I think that the digital, the digital workplace that we had imagined in 2021 and started experiencing um, is going to come fully real in 2022 and be uh, one major driver of, of adoption. Um, the, the, the second um, uh, driver I think um, will be around supply chains. Global supply chains will restart in 2022 in continuation of how they restarted in the second half of 2021. The um, bottlenecks around that will need technology enablement. Fulfillment around that will be complex. E-commerce will thrive. That will drive consumption of cloud, consumption um, of various logistics, IoT, 5G connectivity. Um, driving the digital market further in 2022. The third, um, uh, I think, driver of, 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 of digital for, for this year, um, and, and I, I would actually think further along, is related to user centricity and the, the deficit um, of user, user, user centric. Um, um, platforms in the B2B world versus the B2C world. So in the B2C world, the, 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 the user centricity and the user experience on smartphones, smart watches, smart TVs, autonomous cars are um, way above what we see in the B2B world. And the transformation of that, the design of interfaces that work and that people use to generate ROI for the businesses that uh, have invested in them um, will be also a key uh, part of this market getting bigger and the services um, required to make this market work consumed by the various people in this ecosystem. Thanks, Jerome. Um, so we will get a chance to talk about how um, there may be certain storm clouds on the horizon uh, separately. And I don't want to talk to you about things like inflation, but um, based on those trends that you see uh, that you've described now around digital adoption, then you would clearly be of the view that that's here to stay and something that could uh, develop only positively in the years beyond 2022. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, 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 there are questions around um, valuations that we'll touch upon later for the M&A context, but in terms of the market size and the market opportunity and the adjacencies and this ecosystem constantly getting bigger. I think we're quite confident about that trend for this year and the years to come. Great. Thank you very much. To bring Alex and Sylvain into the discussion here, um, what are you seeing, Alex, in terms of the commercialization of technologies and some of those technologies coming of age now at this point? What are the drivers behind it? Yeah, um, it's a great question. From, from my perspective, there are a lot of different technologies that are 
being rapidly commercialized amid this massive wave of digital transformations. And uh, this growth is really being underpinned by a lot of the drivers that Jerome just touched on uh, a minute ago. And I would, I would echo that, um, you know, these trends are here to stay and we'll, we'll continue to see them in the foreseeable future. Um, in my view, our increasing reliance on technology solutions is really a symptom of both our times as, as peers in the digital age and our individual desires to have high quality interactions and solutions at our fingertips. And I would, again, just completely agree with uh, Jerome's comments earlier about the, the reasons for the digital adoption trends currently ongoing and uh, the fact that they are, again, here to stay going forward. And from a seller's perspective, I think it's important to recognize that legacy technology solutions are continuously being replaced by new technology solutions. And as a result, it is very important to be cognizant of where your business or partner ecosystem is on the relative maturity curve for, uh, um, you know, uh, for your business. And uh, that's, that's just important in order to optimize timing for when you go to market and uh, uh, making sure that you, you get top-notch dollar for, uh, for your business. But uh, I'll be brief in my response there, maybe pause, um, but we'd be happy to elaborate on any of the points here. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting to know, Alex, which of those partner technology ecosystems do you think are, the, are likely to be the most attractive in the year ahead? Yep, absolutely. Uh, I would preface my response by saying that from an M&A perspective, we are witnessing strong demand trends across most ecosystems supporting uh, digital transformation, including some of the larger spaces like SAP, ServiceNow, Microsoft, and, uh, and Salesforce. And uh, in fact, over the past few weeks, we sold two businesses and two of these ecosystems with uh, very healthy valuation multiples and uh, witnessed pretty strong demand in both uh, the strategic and uh, financial sponsor space. Um, however, with that said, when it comes to which partner universes are looking especially attractive, I think that there is a natural correlation between uh, demand and valuations on one hand and the growth profile of the underlying technology on the other where the growth profile in turn is linked to uh, the size of the market opportunity being addressed, the relative maturity profile of the technology solution, and uh, the degree of differentiation uh, for that technology solution versus others within that space. And if you look at the data and analytics space, there have been a number of platforms and technologies that have uh, been exhibiting phenomenal growth over the past few years. And this growth has been a boon to uh, the respective professional um, services ecosystems. And earlier this month, we closed on the sale of Four Mile Analytics, uh, the go-to partner in the Looker GCP ecosystem, to S4 Capital, a uh, digital media company. And we're pleasantly surprised about the interest level in the business. Uh, as background, Looker was acquired by Google about two years ago, and uh, Looker has evolved to become the shining star, uh, quote unquote, within the GCP platform. And as a result of Four Mile's strong positioning in this market and very robust growth profile, we were able to garner very competitive bidding activity in this process and uh, sold it at a, at a premium valuation. However, that's just, just one example of an ecosystem that has become particularly attractive. And there are many others out there. We've also received uh, M&A inbound interest for partners in the, the Okta ecosystem, for instance, uh, which provides identification management services to public and private sectors. Um, and I think overall, there's just strong investor appetite across all partner ecosystems tied to uh, digital transformation. But those that will witness outsized um, demand are those that are the most differentiated and have the strongest growth profile characteristics. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, Sylvain, uh, you're, you're in uh, Singapore, and thanks again for joining us at what must be a very late hour there. Um, perhaps you could uh, comment on, on, on that in particular. Uh, tell us what you think this, this particular trend means for sellers and for buyers. What are the risks and opportunities? Yes, thank you, Paul. So, um, as Alex rightly explained, there are a lot of emerging technologies in the market, uh, creating a lot of, uh, I'd say, buzz and m and activities. Um, and also something very important that Jerome touched base quickly is a, a shortage of skills across the market, especially in the IT services industry, both in terms of legacy platform, like for instance, SAP, but also for some of these newest, newest emerging technologies. I mean, uh, Alex, uh, for instance, uh, ServiceNow, Milsar, 
speak about uh, UI Pass and Aplan, a, a, a lot of emerging platforms that are attracting, attracting a lot of interest. So this is uh, pushing buyers to acquire even smaller companies in the search for talent, which means for, for sellers, if you can put together a compelling employee value proposition where you can demonstrate that you can attract, train efficiently resources and retain them, then you will be very attractive for, for most, uh, most of the buyers. Um, it's also creating some uh, additional opportunities for cross-border transactions. Indeed, with this uh, scarcity of resources, the nearshoring trend continues to gather some pass uh, with acquisition of firms that have some presence all over the globe, but also in uh, countries or regions like uh, Latin, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia as well. Uh, what's especially attractive about those regions, it's just it's not just the fact that they are nearby, but it's, it's also uh, the fact that there is a, a very clear and neat uh, cost arbitrage compared to, to more maybe a uh, mature market. In terms of risk for sellers, I'd say that the buyer demands can change quickly. And with all of these uh, emerging technologies, uh, as uh, Alex uh, mentioned, there will be a wave of rationalization. So uh, if you're in the heart of trend, you should get ready uh, to, to proceed and uh, uh, serve the way uh, right now. Certainly time to be considering expert advice to be able to, to take advantage of the opportunity then. Jerome, would you um, like to comment more on what uh, even the broader uh, trends are meaning for buyers and sellers in this, in this market right now? I think we, we, we're, in a, we're in a market where um, we have a lot of demand. I think we've, we've addressed that. We have a lot of scale um, and we have growth. So I think as investors look at this market, um, whether this is um, private equity or um, effectively global global investors looking at investing in, in in IT and consulting stocks, they'll be investing in a growth market and in a, in, a, in a pretty in a pretty sort of low risk low low, low risk growth market um, because of the fundamentals of it. I think what um, what 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 we are seeing in the M&A market um, is a, a, a different, a different, um, um, uh, I think a different approach since Gen 1, where a lot of the deals from 2021 are continuing in that same dynamic of um, high demand, high aggressiveness to get deals done, processes being kind of shortcut, high valuations. For 2022, I think we are wondering what will happen in the second half. We think that um, although we've seen a bit of a dip um, in a few of the major stocks since Jan 1, effectively that hasn't affected yet the private markets and that many of the most successful transactions on the private markets are niche companies that are of a sufficiently um, small scale in the global scheme of things, fast growth with the rare skills that Sylvain was touching upon um, that should um, effectively uh, keep uh, levels of interest and levels of valuation as we saw them last year. Yeah, okay. Um, some, of the, some of those storm clouds uh, on the horizon that we talked about earlier uh, being, being addressed there. Um, you also did talk favorably about supply chain um, disruption and how that was uh, expected to reset, turn around certainly this year compared to last year. Um, Alex, is that something that you are seeing um, in the markets as a potential risk uh, in the M&A uh, landscape uh, up ahead? Yeah, I, I would say, so it, it's certainly become very topical, supply chain disruption. It's, it's very rare these days to, to read the news and not learn about uh, a new disruption in the supply chain, whether it be due to the global chip shortages, uh, constrained labor market, rising geopolitical risks, or even the, the Suez Canal blockage last year. And these disruptions can and have been incredibly costly to companies globally. And the frequency of some of these disruptions and the degree to them uh, has been rising over the past few years. Um, and, and as a result, uh, improving supply chain Visibility and, and flexibility has become a, a key corporate objective around the world. And 
And this is in turn translated to significant interest in digital solutions from, uh, from an investment perspective. Uh, there are certainly risks, but I would say that it, all, it, it poses opportunities for companies uh, to, to grow in that area. And uh, for, for general color uh, on the industry, we are working with a client that has carved out a, uh, a leadership position in the digital supply chain space and uh, his company is witnessing uh, the release of, of strong pent-up demand uh, that was previously um, kind of held up because of uh, the COVID environment. Um, and this is particularly interesting because um, this trend um, is, is kind of in contrast to some um, trends and views that were in place leading up to COVID-19. For instance, a lot of companies that we uh, were, were talked to uh, um, prioritized um, other parts of their their you know uh, their business for investment over supply chain and obviously now um, in the current environment that that calculus has really turned its uh, turned uh, upside down and uh, supply chain visibility has just become a, a focal point for for a lot of corporate executives um, and overall I think uh, technologies that that help address these supply chain disruptions will be in high demand and and as Jerome stated earlier the Bottlenecks from these disruptions um, need technology enablement, and, and this technology enablement will draw consumption of cloud and other technology solutions. So it's it's certainly an opportunity um, for a lot of companies to invest more in, and I think uh, a platform that will garner a lot of interest, um, generally speaking, in the in the M&A market. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I think at this point, I'd like to, to, to add something myself as well, seeing from a uh, buy side perspective, but in this market where um, such, such uh, great prospects are appearing for sellers of businesses, uh, buyers are particularly challenged. It's a seller's market in a sense. So um, what is happening is that buyers are having to um, be more restrictive over the processes that they enter, um, so it's not a waste resource and opportunity. Um, and uh, they're also having to be better informed um, than they might have been. And in a buyer's market, you can be reactive and wait for an IM to land on your desk, uh, as it were. Uh, but in this situation, you need to really try to, A, get ahead of processes um, that, as Jerome commented, are um, moving at uh, lightning pace now um, and cut out many of the, uh, the stages that they, they, they may have done in former markets. Um, but you also need to uh, be acquainted sufficiently with a rapidly changing uh, environment of uh, potential targets to understand where um, a, a specific target fits in, uh, in the, the, the relative value of what, what there is available in the market so that you can bid with the kind of confidence that you need to, to be as competitive as other um, tend to acquire as investors may be, given simply levels of capital. Um, that may uh, enhance what values uh, investors are prepared to pay for the same asset. Uh, so a lot of pressure that, that puts a lot of one of the risks for buyers is at this level of heat, you can miss things, you cannot be sufficiently informed to bid with confidence on something, um, much as the opportunities uh, that can be realized of ROI enhancing acquisitions of these uh, assets um, is, is there for the taking. Um, so we just... Go from go 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 around uh, the panel here. I'd just like to hear, um, starting with Sylvain, then you know what are the key considerations um, that you think any uh, choose buyers or sellers um, should should have in mind as they contemplate a transaction, go into a transaction the coming year, and then we'll move to Alex and Jerome. It's the way. I, I would say that the, the most important is to know what do they want to achieve before starting a process. Indeed, uh, as uh, we have discussed, there are a lot of opportunities right now, a lot, a lot of noise is there, but what's your ultimate goal? And uh, joining forces, for instance, for a seller with a financial investor or strategic investors are, are two different things. Uh, we are talking a different time frame, different time of time of reasons. On one case, you might need some capital on the other hand, you might not need some capital, but might, might need to be part of a bigger network with uh, different goals in terms of uh, personal and uh, professional objectives. So I think uh, in, in both cases, you need to have a very well-defined strategy to really be sure what do I need to achieve my, uh, my, dream, uh, my dream scenario. Uh, 
uh, I'd say that the most important as of today, because you can't pursue every single opportunity uh, in the market. You, you need to choose and then get ready for this uh, specific opportunity. Got it. Yeah, if I could just pick up on one point there, just before we move on, just on, on, on the participation of private equity uh, in the market, are you seeing a trend there? Yeah, that's something we, we, we have seen since the last two years and that has increased more and more. Private equities are now very active in the knowledge, knowledge economy uh, sector overall, uh, IT services, technology sector. They are there, they are there to stay, and uh, they are competing uh, front end with uh, strategics right now. Uh, before, they were mostly financial investors. Now, some of them are really trying to build some platforms so they can bring some of them to some extent part of the strategic value that some uh, strategic investor can also bring to the table. But uh, it needs to be looked into in, in more details. And uh, that's definitely something that uh, sellers need to take into consideration before starting a, a process. Great, thank you very much. Alex, considerations that sellers or buyers should be taking uh, in this current market when they're contemplating a transaction in the next 12 months? Yeah, I, so personally, I think, I think, I think Sylvain hit it right on that. So it's uh, uh, not only having a, a great strategy going out, but also I would say maybe just to add to it is uh, considering the timing. So you, you don't want to go to market um, when you're not quite ready or right at the scale at which you would fetch, um, you know, an optimal valuation to to maximize equity value, and you don't want to do it too late, such that you miss the the opportunity and your the underlying technology that you're supporting is um, uh, becoming less attractive. So it's uh, timing and and having uh, a, a well well thought out strategy for uh, um, picking a partner and, and moving forward. I would say. Thanks a lot, Alex and Jerome. Use. Sure, I think I'll, I'll pick on I'll pick on I'll pick on one topic here, which which might be around um, uh, around around preparation. I think um, that there are lots of opportunities. I think the ecosystem is seeing deals happen on a daily basis. Some valuations are public; they're high. Some entrepreneurs um, have seen their competitors being consolidated and wondering what that means for their competitive positioning in the market. I think all of those things can lead to want to seize the opportunity. And th there's the, the right opportunity to be seized is, uh, I think, the opportunity that's well prepared for. It's, um, it's still a market where there are a lot of sellers. There are a lot of businesses. There will be selectivity. Um, the market, the valuations last year have led a lot of um, uh, people to be into that opportunity. And I think being well prepared and showing something that is of quality um, enables to actually maximise that as opposed to be pushed by the environment into seizing an opportunity that wasn't prepared. Great. Um, thank you. I, I think at this point we'll move on to some of the questions um, that we've been asked by, uh, by uh, viewers. So um, I have a question here. I'll, I'll take the first question here. Uh, if I may. So um, what is the trend for mid-cap international acquisitions, cross-border build-ups? Um, big, big topic. Um, cross-border transactions um, are um, on the rise. Uh, certainly in the knowledge economy, there is uh, burgeoning activity in this area. I think it's the great ambition of uh, mid-cap to be able to uh, build presence in multiple markets, leverage uh, talent and IP and uh, track record across those. Um, what we've seen in, in the environment last year um, that was coming, coming off the positive um, trajectory of actually being able to do things more effectively internationally through the logistical um, pressures actually that came through the pandemic um, was that the, the, the market and the, the heat in the market, um, the preponderance of sellers meant that um, it, it became a difficult task for um, mid-cap um, buyers to actually break in in the ways they might have envisaged uh, into uh, in, in, in cross-border transactions. It doesn't mean a lot uh, didn't happen 
Um, but I think there was a consistent finding that actually there, were, there was a, quite a harsh realism about what um, buyers needed to do about their strategies when it was uh, possible. And that through, through research and through understanding, through up against um, more targets, the process of, of education, I think, in many cases led to uh, businesses being creative about those strategies and finding ways where the unicorn wasn't there, but there's a slice of something there that actually has a potential to be built upon. And a more, um, uh, perhaps a slower uh, build-up of capability foreign markets with, through, through which to channel um, the, the, uh, the company assets, um, it was actually the more viable way. And I expect that to continue into this year as, again, all, for all of these reasons of pressures on buyers to be competitive, um, but also because buyers have discovered, um, I think, and, and in some cases matured uh, acquirers that don't make, aren't, aren't so prolific, but matured to the extent that they now can implement such a more sophisticated well, and, and perhaps less advantageous, but um, now operable strategy in foreign markets. Um, so a very interesting area uh, across, on cross-border. Tech, obviously, global platform, we, we see um, more than half of our activity uh, runs in through cross-border transactions. Um, I have another question here um, for Jerome. You touched on this a bit. Uh, could you tell us what changes you've seen in the process of M&A uh, over the past several years, it says here. Let's, let's contextualize this in the terms of last year and what we think we'll build into this year. Sure. I think quite a few things have changed. I think it's been um, a really exciting market for that. I'd probably put it down to, um, to two things. I think there's, there's, there's one element where our industry is becoming more mature for M&A. Um, as we, as we, we touched upon, I think, 10, 15 years ago, uh, this was an industry where investors were cautious because it was a project-based industry where effectively your assets went home every day. Um, today, we're talking about a mature market where um, investors of all, with all kinds of risk profiles um, are spending time. Um, what does that mean? That means that we're seeing um, a lot of uh, strategic thought happening at the beginning of deals. Um, to be sort of more... More, more detailed on that, um, what, what, what I'm saying is that if uh, we have financial investors um, recruiting consultants, spending time to understand an ecosystem and understand its adjacencies and understand where the margins are, where the growth is and where potential build up and further acquisitions are as part of an investment thesis. So we're seeing a complex and mature thought through investment thesis um, going into our processes that we didn't used to see because we're seeing um, more sophisticated and mature investors inside it. So I think that's um, uh, you know, one uh, interesting interesting trend. Uh, in terms of 2021 and 2020, 2022, uh, sort of uh, pandemic and post-pandemic related, um, we've seen, first of all, I think a, a, um, a very interesting trend that's been driven by uh, the attractiveness of this market um, and the heat in this market, which is that a lot of processes are not wide auctions. We're seeing that in a lot of the things that we've closed last year, we um, thought that we would uh, uh, be running an auction and we ended up not running an auction because we'll have one, three, five parties that we deal with as a, 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 as a matter of priority. And we spend time a lot of time with very interested parties, as opposed to spending uh, an average amount of time with many more parties. So this is uh, this is something that uh, we're seeing uh, as, a, as a as a very strong trend, and some processes get um, uh, preempted, as we as as we say, effectively get get done with one party. Um, the the second thing that we're we're seeing is the the virtual deal. I think the first deal that we did that was entirely virtual was the, the sale of Force D to Wipro in June 2020 um, in the middle of the, the pandemic. Uh, and the, 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 what we're seeing today is that the, the virtual deal is absolutely commonplace. Um, that is here to stay. Um, I think the work streams that are um, offline um, in our transaction processes are largely around relationship building, largely around um, integration, around the teams understanding each other, but they're not around transaction execution in the sense of 
um, due diligence, um, negotiation, documentation. So uh, I think that's a clear a trend that we were forced into in 2020 and parts of 2021 by the pandemic, but that we see in 2022 as a trend to stay in the way people do deals. That's great. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, I've got something, Sylvain, to pick up on that you, you said earlier that relates to the question that's arrived, here, which is quite a fundamental question. The question is, what is the first step to a successful m and You know, that's a, that's a huge uh, potential range of answers. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's important for owners to know what they want right, and to translate that into, into opportunities. Perhaps you could um, elaborate a bit on that, uh, especially with the experience that you have working with businesses on multi-year relationships that culminate in a transaction, how that transformed over that time. Yeah, uh, I think for, for an m and project to be successful, uh, Jerome uh, mentioned that before, but for me, it, it's uh, really about two things. One, shareholder alignment, and two, preparation. First thing is, what do you want to achieve? And for every single person, the definition of success is different. You know, do you want a, value of sh a variation of 10, 20, 50 million? Do you want to exit, stay with the company for three years and uh, go play golf or sip a cocktail or, or on the beach? Or do you want to really go for the next uh, growth stage for the next 10 years of your life? And all these questions needs to be addressed before starting the preparation process. And it will impact not only the timing, are you ready or not? And uh, can you fulfill your personal and professional ambition at that time? And then if you're not, what do you need to do in order to get ready? And this might take three months, six months, one year, but this is something that is to be taken seriously. Uh, most entrepreneurs are gonna go through this process maybe once in their life. I know there are some uh, serial entrepreneurs, uh, but uh, still for most of them, it's a, a once in a lifetime event. So it's something that really needs to be taken seriously and conducted as a project in itself. And uh, also, it's, uh, you have professionals that are, it's their job to do that on a regular basis. You can't really uh, improvise, you know, knowing what to do to optimize a, a transaction. So uh, if, if you can, uh, maybe I'm biased, but uh, uh, do that uh, with, uh, with some people that have your, your best interests in mind. Very well said. Yes, I suppose in the same way that businesses are prepared to acquire um, other businesses because they realize they can't even organically grow the capabilities to do things that they need to do in the current environment, um, there are things in M&A that clearly uh, are, are, are best left for profession. So, um, Alex, I've got a question for you um, that I'm assuming is coming from a founder. It says, what needs to be in place for a founder not to have to be part of the earnout? Um, so let's bring this again to the context of um, the current environment, um, because I think structures are um, getting impacted uh, by, by the heat in the market. What are you seeing or you know, what advice do you have um, based on current conditions uh, for founders that may consider that, um, that, they, that uh, you know, they, want, they want an exit that's going to least impact uh, the deal they get, um, but allows them to exit? Yeah, and so from my view, I think uh, an earnout is is a pretty um, unfortunately common uh, uh, inclusion in the structure. Um, but the the best way that one can kind of get ahead of this and and negotiate the the optimal structure that that fits your you know desired goals and objectives is to um, again set up a process that that effectively lays out the strategy that you have in terms of what. Um, your your ultimate desire is, and then garnering the the most interest from from bidders so that you can extract um, the best provisions in a in a deal structure. But um, um, yeah, we we we've we've often encountered this. Um, burnout is uh, is a you know um, uh, a word that uh, many people kind of uh, uh, veer away from. But there's there's many times that you can structure it to enhance um, the certainty that you you receive the consideration. Um, in, a, in a short order, but there's a number of different parameters to kind of outline and, and discuss on that point. But um, uh, the, the best thing is really just getting in a position to be able to negotiate the best structure that you can. Um, and I think the best way to do that is having an effective process 
um, you know, to, to Sylvain and Jerome's points, preparing well and, uh, and having a, a very well laid out strategy. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, back over to Jerome. I have a question or two questions really that I'm going to combine about size. Um, one, one, one of our attendees um, asked, is there, a, is there a size at which you feel companies become too large and have limited opportunities for exit other than public market and a handful of large PE firms? Um, and another said, um, are we seeing boutique management consultancies um, up for sale? Are they profitable? It appears it's a tough place. Is this true? Not quite, not quite the antithesis of the former question, but can you talk, Jerome, perhaps a, a bit about what you're seeing under in current market uh, conditions at the larger and smaller end uh, of, the, of the market? Sure, Paul. So um, clearly size will um, impact in, in, in interest um, and value. I think there was always a, a, a very clear concept that unlike other industries, particularly uh, SaaS and software, consulting companies are hard to scale. And so when they're small, they're more risky investment propositions. And so they attract lower valuations in a multiple perspective uh, from larger, larger transactions. Now that threshold um, for feasibility um, has been moving around a bit particularly in 2021 and 2020, what we've seen is that if you're in the right space that's fast growth, you might have a niche company with 40 or 50 people that um, some of the majors uh, would have teams about half that size in that space. And that could make you valuable and very transactable. And these are companies that would be, in US dollar terms, seven, eight, 9 million turnover companies, normally growing 20 to 35% per year. Uh, smaller than that, we do see um, a, a, an actual cliff uh, of the level of risk that buyers and investors are willing to take. On the larger end, uh, and I think that was the question, Paul, um, that do you get too big? Um, and I think when you do get big, and some companies have in consulting. I think um, in Europe, we have uh, PA Consulting. That was an example. Uh, we have um, Ancura. We have um, BIP in Italy that are consulting companies that have gotten to the 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 million of EBITDA and thousands of people. What happens when you get into that zone is that your exit options are there. And we saw it how um, Capco, for example, exited with Wipro last year, um, but the options are um, smaller. So it, you, you, I don't think it, it has a direct impact on feasibility. It's just that a large company has normally a small number of very interested suitors, whereas a small company has a large number of interested suitors. Um, and putting that in the balance, um, I think um, it's it's a... It's a, it's, it, it, these are different types of process, but they're definitely interesting for both. That's great. That's very, 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 very good. Um, I think one question, we've got time for one more question that I'll, I'll answer, um, which is uh, from, from one of our a pre question we had, kind of hot topic, um, again, which, which could be as broad as you like. But what drives and trends do you see for ESG companies? Um, at this point. So sustainability, no surprise, uh, it's a huge uh, area of interest um, in the M&A market right now. It's capabilities that all businesses need to some extent, uh, to the extent that uh, businesses are looking not only to add on capabilities, but actually to make dimensional uh, uh, transactions that will actually be something that will transform the whole nature, the culture of the business and be, be played out across the whole broader offering of to change the employee value proposition um, in the way that we may have seen you know, Big Four setting up um, digital uh, uh, parts of their, of, of their operation to actually allow culture to, uh, to emanate into the rest of the business and have a broader effect on simply adding on capability. Um, we're seeing that as something potential in, in the SG space. We're seeing uh, the importance of proprietary data of high day rate work, um, strategic work, and get to the, this value in C-suite. 
and accelerators and potentially products uh, within service businesses that are really driving the interest of valuations. Um, so um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you for your questions. Um, a number of questions came through um, that we weren't able to answer. Some others uh, that had already been through. We will get back to you. And um, greatly appreciate it. And uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.